All right, everyone. Um, so welcome to our panel. Uh, this is the second annual forum, um, Ideas to Articles, Undergraduate Research in Economic and Economics and Finance. Uh, this event is sponsored by the Jules Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance and the Griswold Center for Economic Policy Studies. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, the first thing is, if you haven't already scanned the QR code when you were coming in, please be sure to do so after the event. Um, it's outside on the doors. The second thing is we do, uh, uh, this event will be uh, video recorded or it is being video recorded. Um, just keep that in mind. And then during the Q&A session, um, you'll be able to raise your hands uh, and just ask questions. The boom mics will pick up your questions. I'd also like to mention that we do have some snacks for everyone who's here, and those snacks are outside behind the room. Um, if you go out through the back door, you'll be able to pick them up again after the event. So um, without any further ado, I'm going to hand this over to our moderator, Shirley Wren, um, who's going to lead the session. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you so much, Claudie. Hi, everyone. Is everyone able to hear me? They need to speak into the mic for the recording session. Okay, just to be sure. Hi everyone, my name is Shirley. I'm currently a sophomore studying economics here, and I'm also on the student leadership board for the JR Center for Public Policy and Finance. I'm very excited to be your moderator for today. So thank you so much for joining us for the undergraduate research panel. It's really great to see everyone in person again. We'll start off with the panelists introducing themselves, um, giving a little bit of background on their research experiences, then we'll dive into a panel discussion. And then we'll leave about half an hour uh, at the end for everyone to ask any panelists. So, so to start off, we will start with Leland and then Emily, Lyra, Fazan, if you could just um, introduce yourselves and then give a bit of background about your research undergrad. Hi everyone, my name is Leland. I'm a senior in the economics department. I'm also on the JRC Student Leadership Board. Um, for my junior paper, I studied a specific Supreme Court case and how it affected litigation trends in securities fraud class actions. And for my senior thesis right now, I'm working on a project that um, basically describes how monetary policy lags have evolved over time in the United States. Um, let me just say, uh, panelists, you're welcome to take your mask off when you're speaking if you'd like to. Um, sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Emily. I'm also a senior in the economics department. For my junior paper, I researched the effects of Trump tweeting on six different exchange rates. Um, and for my senior thesis, I am uh, looking at the effect of minimum wage increases so, um, and state, state minimum wage increases on mortgage delinquency rates. I don't know which one I'm saying. <laughs> so my name is Lira Mota. Uh, I am a postdoc researcher here at the JR Center for Public Policy and Finance. Uh, I hold a PhD from Columbia University, and I'm here for the whole academic year, so I finished my PhD very recently, only last year. And before the, this, I did my master in Brazil, the Fundação Getúlio Vargas, where I study economics. Uh, and after I finish my period here, I will be joining MIT Sloan as an assistant professor. So uh, my research is a little bit in the interplay of finance and macroeconomics, and in particular, I'm interested in questions about like how asset prices are shaped by investors' behavior. But furthermore, how asset prices actually change their behavior. So for example, in my, in my job market, at, which brought me here, I studied how a demand for what we call a safe asset can actually shape the way that the, co the companies are issuing debt and changing their leverage decisions. Uh, I guess we're going to have more time to discuss about research. Uh, what I want to say, so uh, somebody asked me here, uh, how, what is my experience with undergrad research? I'm very happy to say that I worked with two undergrads during the summer, uh, and we were working on a, on a project of systematic credit investing, so basically setting investment strategies for the credit market, so for corporate bonds, and I thought it was a very cool opportunity. So, and 
it was very good for me and then I hope that people did please and in Aditya who worked with me I hope that they have enjoyed as much as I did so it's kind of exciting being participating of the panel today um. Hi everyone, I'm Fezan. I'm a sixth year PhD candidate uh, with the economics department. Uh, and my research is in the area of development economics and finance. So specifically, I'm interested to study how technological and financial innovations impact development outcomes, such as productivity, inequality, market completeness, etc. So um, that's kind of been what my research has been about while at Princeton, and that's what my uh, what's called our job market paper, which is what you go on the job market with is about as well. Um, when I was an undergrad, um, I actually had the good fortune of being an RA uh, for a couple of semesters with uh, a, a professor at my undergrad institution. And during that experience, I helped her summarize a whole bunch of academic papers related to financial crises in developing countries. And that really got me thinking about this intersection of finance and development, which is kind of what I do now. So um, very happy to talk more about how those kind of ideas that I developed during those experiences led me to uh, doing uh, studying them in more detail as a grad student. So yeah, happy to be here. Well, it's a pleasure to have all of you on the panel today, and really interesting to hear about all of your projects. So to start off, you know, research is often used as a pretty broad and umbrella term and a little bit mysterious as well. So I'm curious about what excites you about doing research in economics and finance. And perhaps if you could help us differentiate what, uh, what, what's different about theoretical research and empirical research. So if we can start off with Lyra on this question. Great. So I'll get this one again. So what excites me about finance and economics? I'll start by the, from there. So what I think is exciting is that finance and economics is one of these rare fields in which you can kind of put together like humanities, day to life issues with quantitative methods. And if you think about this, it's very challenging because, all, for example, you could be doing physics where you are also doing some real world things and using quantitative methods but in physics, you have perfect experiments, right? So we can control a room and run our experiments perfectly. In economics, we cannot. We have to work with the data that we have available and search for questions with the data that we have. This poses greater challenges, right? Because it's not that we are going to pose, that we are going to be able to answer questions so precisely, perhaps. But it's also very exciting because you're all the time trying to invent new methods and also to discover new data sets or even discover new questions that we didn't think about before. Uh, and, and the answers for those questions have real, real effects in the day-to-day -day life of everybody. That goes from, like, how are you going to optimally save for, for example, your retirement? That means how much money you should put aside, but also how you should invest this money. To broader questions, should like how are you going to handle pandemics? Like, is the policy that goes from like writing the policy right? So, should we lend to this firm or to this other firm? And once you've lent to this firm, what are the consequences? The ones that we expected. So, all those questions for me it means that it's very broad, and and but also has very like I think very tangible um, consequences. For, for 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 us, so that's what I like about economics and finance, and it's kind of cool that you research about something that people read on the news as well, so you can kind of talk to people about it. And you asked me about theory versus empirics. You might have already uh, learned from what I'm talking about data that I'm empiricist, so I work much more with data than with theory. But the way that I think about theory and empirics is that they go hand to hand. So what do I mean by that? Is that usually a good empirical research has a very solid theoretical ground. That means that if you are doing research with data and you just like uncovered some relationship or maybe some forecasting power, for us as economists, that's not usually sufficient. You want to understand why this is happening. And, and the way that we typically do this is by writing down a theory 
that kind of explains the mechanisms that you have that it's like the solid it's a solid story right a solid mechanism that explains why is x influencing uh, y and but then on the other hand what is a good theoretical research is the one that has empirical grounding right so it doesn't matter if you come up with this beautiful theory in economics that says for example how investors should I don't know how our asset price is determined if this has no no grounding the data. So that's why I think they are hand to hand. But what is going to differentiate you guys from being a theorist or an empiricist is where you're innovating. So in which margin are you, is your contribution? So you can think about yourselves, for example, as consuming theory and innovating the data. So basically, you're trying to test the theories that are available, or you can think about yourselves saying like let me put up this theory here and see if there is some backing in the data and then usually what is going to be the case is that much more research is going to be developed based on the theory that people think is reasonable. Thank you so much Lyra. Would anyone else like to jump in? Um, I could just add with the empirical research I also I think it's cool how you could take two different approaches. You could take more of a predictive an analysis or you could take more of a causal effect inference. So um, I think depending on the application, it's, you know, those, those are two different approaches that you can take for research in economics and finance. Um, my research specifically has been more focused on causal effect um, for my senior thesis. So, you know, you take, it, it's a little bit different of a process that you take um, in order to run your regressions and analyze your results. So um, I just like how it could, research in economics and finance covers a, a, a really wide range of different applications. And I also think it's cool that it ties in a lot of, um, you know, broader issues such as issues with data collection um, and biases in the data. And I think it's important to think about that as well when you're trying, conducting empirical research. Just to like piggyback off that. Um, one thing I like about economics and finance research, um, if you look at like a field like math or like physics, I think it's like really hard as like an undergraduate to like penetrate that and like add something valuable. It's like a high barrier to adding stuff. I think with a lot of empirical work, um, like how well your paper is and like how much of a contribution you make is also like a function of how well you understand your data set and how well you actually understand like how it's collected, kind of like what Emily was saying. What are the biases? How is it collected? How is it actually labeled, categorized? And that's like something that like anybody could just learn if they put enough data, uh, if they put enough time and sink enough energy into it. So I think it's a lot more accessible as an undergrad to like make a contribution to. I would say just one other thing, which is, I think the empirical part is generally as an undergrad more accessible than the theory part. So I think some of the tools that you might need to, to innovate on the theory part, which is what Lear was talking about, are tools that you might only be able to develop in, in graduate school or if you've taken graduate classes. But on the data part, also Princeton, maybe we'll get to this, has these incredible resources in terms of data access um, and, uh, and library resources in terms of people who are familiar with that. So I really think that, as Lena mentioned, on the empirical side, you really have the ability to discover new things and, and, under, and innovate in a way that in other fields may not be possible. Yeah, for sure, thank you. You know, multiple of you touched on data or kind of pieces in the research process. Um, but, you know, as an undergrad myself, I'm definitely really interested in learning more about the research process as a whole, either in the context of doing independent work as an undergrad or thinking about bigger scale collaborative projects, you know, across institutions and, and academics. So maybe we can start with Fazan, this question, can you help us break down the end to end process of doing a research project, you know, from getting an idea to start with and then testing it and then refining that idea all the way to publishing it? Yes, it is. It can be a long journey, so uh, I'll try and keep it <laughs> short. Um, but I think, but I think the idea is where does the germ come from? I think is the is a, is an interesting. Where do you get the idea from? And so, I, in my experience, I can just talk you through one of my papers that is now been published. So, it really, I can tell you the entire story. Um, so, I, as I said, I'm interested in development economics, and when I was studying for my development 
qualifying exam, which you have to do to finish your classwork at grad school, um, I came across this paper which studied how malaria eradication programs in the U.S. affected uh, socioeconomic outcomes. In other words, if you're healthier, do you, do you make more money? Which seems like a reasonable thing. Um, and so as I was reading it, there was a footnote in the paper that said, because of, this, because of data limitations, we're only able to focus the U.S. part of the study on white males. And so I started thinking about that, um, and, and the interventions in the U.S. were launched in the early 1900s and in the South. And so from just my knowledge of the history of the U.S. at the time, this was the Jim Crow era, I said, well, okay, what happens when you think about how the same intervention affected racial gaps, okay? And so the, the reason I'm, I, I told you this is so that just to give you a sense of reading the existing literature made me think of this interesting idea that seemed that had not been addressed before in the, in, in the literature because of data limitations. And then, so the first, so that was the idea. Doesn't mean it could have led to anything. The second step was, talking to a uh, professor at Princeton who does more research in economic history, talking to one of, someone in my cohort who's interested in these topics, who's a good friend of mine. And then we were both interested. She said, now the data is better. You can link people across census years, for example, and get a finer source of variation. Um, so you can think about the impacts by race. Um, and so that was, so the first was just the idea. The second was validation that this is an interesting idea and the resources and the data exist to answer it. And then the third, the third aspect is actually going and doing the data analysis, which involves getting data access, so all the permissions that you need, doing all the data cleaning that you need, doing the initial data analysis to see is there something interesting there. And sometimes the process ends there, right? There, there could be nothing interesting there, and then you kind of start, get back on, on the horse and start all over again. Um, if there is something interesting there, then presenting it at uh, internal Princeton seminars, presenting it at, say, we have these conferences, PhD student conferences, other conferences, um, getting feedback, writing it up, submitting it to a journal, for figuring out which journal, so that's the third step, fourth step, figuring out which journal to submit it to, submitting it, then either it gets rejected, so you start all over again, um, or, or you go down to another uh, journal that you might think has a better shot of accepting it. Um, we, are, we were fortunate enough to get a, what's called a revise and resubmit, so they asked us to revise it uh, with some questions, so worked on that, resubmitted it, and then it was accepted. So kind of that's, that's from start to finish. I don't think I've left anything out. That's how it worked. May I jump in? So, so, so I think one thing that Fazal is saying that I think you guys should remember is that I think different than what you might see in the movies, ideas, they don't, they don't just like hit you and out of a sudden you have an idea. So finding something to research on is going to be an active process. So literally what is going to happen is you might like a topic, okay? And then I think if you ask me if some of you here wants to start, so the best way is to try to work on the topic that you already like. So, okay, so you find some topic and then you guys should also remember that you are not expected to know how to do research. And this is a benefit that you should enjoy the most that you can. Because when you arrive to my place, now you have to, learn, you have to know, right? I, I'm, I'm supposed to know how to do research. You guys don't. So in a sense, you should lever these amazing institutions that you guys are in, which is Princeton, that allows you to come from, I like this topic, let me find this person now that works in this topic and knows how to do research. And then at this point, you can arrive there to say you're a professor, schedule a meeting. Usually, everybody is very willing to talk to people who is interested in your own research. That's what we like, right? To talk about our research. And you arrive there and say, professor, I like this topic. What do you think I should do to start working on here? That's a completely OK question. And then usually the process is going to be start. Usually is going he's go, he or she is going to tell you like a set of papers that is related to this literature that you might start reading, and then you can get an idea like Fazan was telling here. So the point of what I'm trying to say is you should definitely lever the institution where you are, and just embrace the fact that you nobody is born learn how to do research. And I think having guidance in doing research. Is, is very, very useful, very fruitful, both for you and also usually for the professor that you're working with. I just want to say one other thing, which is 
Lira got me thinking. I think the other thing you can do is be interested in a topic, and you might also just be interested in an event. So there's a big kind of economic shock that happened, or something happened um, uh, in the news that is an economic event that intrigues you. And so sometimes just being interested in the event itself can then prompt research questions as well. Um, and, I, and I think that's another approach of where does the idea come from, is sometimes just the event itself can be interesting. Um, I also just want to add, I, I think it's very normal too to start off thinking that you have an idea that you want to explore and then once you start digging a little deeper um, and trying to find data and realizing maybe what what you thought was there might not actually end, you know, end up working out and there's no, no real point in pushing the point. Um, so for instance, that happened to me with my senior thesis. I first wanted to research the effects of prepayment penalties on mortgage delinquencies, but then realized it, would, it was very difficult and expensive trying to get data on um, different prepayment penalties in different states over time. So then I had to revise my thesis topic to um, be able to, uh, in order to be able to complete it with the data that I had available to me. Um, so yeah, I just want to say I think it's very normal to start off with a topic and um, and just move to a different one once you realize it's just not going to work out. Yeah, for sure. So to kind of sum it up, um, I guess, you know, being really observant and active in, in looking for ideas, thinking about them, and then getting others' feedback, validating, um, and, and then from there, collecting the data, doing analysis to see if it's feasible and, and being okay with it not working out the first time, perhaps, and, and then uh, going further to see if that can be presented or published. So hopefully I, I somewhat summed up, um, but I think what's really interesting is that we talk about research as independent work a lot of times, but it's also a very collaborative process. Um, you know, you're always collaborating with other students, professors, etc. So I actually wanted to dig a little bit deeper into this. Um, as I know, probably some students here are doing their JPs or senior thesis and working with advisors. So. Um, how do you, for example, take feedback or advice um, or criticism from an advisor or maybe from other people and then use it to, to improve your research? Maybe we can start with Emily or Leland. Um. Yeah, I can start. Um, I don't know how many of you have, or econ majors or have done like the JP yet. Um, I remember when I did my JP, I, we were assigned, and I think they still do this, um, a graduate student who kind of like informally helps you. I remember I met with him like literally every week um, and basically he was so helpful because uh, like it's really hard to like one once you get your data like understand what's interesting about it um, and what you think is interesting about it you might bring it to like your advisor or, like somebody else and be like oh that's not that interesting so what was helpful for me is you kind of get feedback and you see like along the way what kind of topics and what kind of questions you want to answer. Um, another thing I'll say about that process was uh, lean on professors and people that are, have more experience with you on the econometrics. Because I think what I didn't know is that, I don't know if you've taken like ETO 12 or like data science, is that the class of data science and the class of econometrics out there that you can use is just so broad. And you really only have this very small part of it when you take a class like Eco 312 or just like a data science class here. So you might have a cool data set, but you need other people to tell you what kind of methods to do it on it. So that was that's something I would say. Yeah, um, I'd say in terms of the uh, idea part, especially as a junior, I think I put a lot of pressure on myself in trying to come up with this crazy topic that would add immensely to literature. But I think, you know, especially as a junior, it's your first research piece. Um, it's okay to find a research topic that you're interested in, find a couple papers, and then um, use that as sort of a backbone for your paper and maybe add something that's different, like tweak something, tweak some variable, or add something um, to the model to make it your own. Uh, and I think that's that's something that um, they even encourage to do as a junior because it is very new and it's okay that you're not coming up with this crazy idea um, your first year doing research. So I think that's important to keep in mind. And then also with the research process, the thing that I struggled the most with was the methodology part um, because like Leland mentioned, there's just so many different ways you could approach your question and so many different models you could create. 
Um, so I think definitely leaning on your advisor for that. And I, I, we all we both took Eco 313 and we found it immensely helpful in the methodology part as well. So that's definitely a class you could take um, to teach you more about uh, the different approaches to conducting economics research. But um, but in general, yes, I think taking courses and asking your advisor for those parts of our, were immensely helpful, at least to me. Yeah, for sure. Those are definitely some helpful tips. And so kind of jumping out of doing the independent research projects part, um, I think a lot of students here are also really interested in doing research assistant work for professors, you know, researchers. I know Lyra and Fazal, you mentioned being an RA in your undergrad. So could you talk a little bit about your experience looking for those opportunities and then how they kind of shaped your perspective about research? So, uh, yes, I, I the first uh, research, the first time that I did research was as an RA in undergrad. That was a long time ago. And what, why was I chosen among all the, the students that were in class was because I knew how to program. So I knew how, at the time, I knew how to program in R. And uh, like, I think there were not that many people who were programming in my, at least where I come from. And, that, and then from there, it was kind of natural to start, like that, that, that project was like very data related. So that, I'm mentioning this because I think that there is a set of skills that are usually necessary conditions. And today in economics, if you, you want to work, usually you need to program in, in some language. And that I know of people who use either R, Python. I know that there's people who use Theta, maybe MATLAB. But it's important for you to get started in one of those languages, of those programming languages. And I would say that that's a necessary, necessary step. And to be honest, that's not even only for empirics. If you're doing theory work, usually you're going to have to program also some, some solution, some, something numerically, before you can get to solve it uh, analytic. OK, so I think that's a necessary condition. Is it sufficient? Not at all. So I think in order to be a successful research assistant, what I would say is that you need to be curious. Uh, and it's very rewarding to work with someone that is actually bringing in ideas and maybe critiques or maybe other views uh, about that research project. And then I think that's, so the way that I see a research assistant, uh, a way that is productive, is the way that is productive not only for the person that you are working for, for the professor, say, or the researcher, but also it's productive to you in the sense that you are learning. And the way that you learn should be actively involved, right? Maybe reading the papers that are related to the task that you're doing, maybe asking questions, maybe thinking about what would be the next step or the next contribution or related research question. And, and usually it is the case that if you are this type of research assistant, other opportunities will come up and maybe you become the co-author of that paper. And this didn't happen to me as an undergrad, but it happened to me as a graduate student. I'll just tell you a little bit of my experience. I came from Brazil uh, to Colombia as a research, uh, as a visiting scholar. I was, I was not a PhD student at Colombia. But what happened was that I started working with two professors, first as an RA, and then like I did a good job. I actually put everything, all the time that I had at the time because I thought that was an amazing opportunity. I did a good job. I was invited to be the co-author with the paper. Once I was a co-author in this paper, the, the great thing for me was that at first I was invited to join the PhD program at Columbia. Second, with this paper, I got lots of exposures in conferences because I was presenting this paper. And later, I got my first publication which was a good publication in finance, and of course, and I'll tell you more, I think it was exactly this experience with my two advisors at Columbia that kind of was in that moment that I decided that I wanted to be an academic, because I was the first time in, actually in the frontier of research. And I, and I don't think I would be able to do this by myself, so who brought me to the frontier for the first time were my two advisors. And how did I get there? Through our RA. And how did it work? 
while doing a very good job as an RA. Yeah, so I think, yeah, I think you covered pretty much all of it. I will just add that I can give you more concrete examples of what Lira was talking about, of, of going a bit, a step ahead and thinking a bit more carefully. And it can only, it can be based on what you're interested in. So for my, when I, in my junior year of undergrad, um, uh, the professor I was doing research for had asked me to summarize a whole bunch of papers related to these financial crises. And she was doing it to prep for a course that she was gonna teach, a seminar course that she was gonna teach. Um, and her own research as well. And the way that I kind of, I, the, the, the low hanging fruit is just do what she asks, which is every week, give her a, a, a number of bullet points related to the papers and see what they say. And here's the economic econometric model and this is their empirical strategy, et cetera. But what I really enjoy doing is saying, okay, now I know that you're using these papers to explain this concept to students. Here's maybe how I would do it in terms of drawing graphs and thinking about here's what students might respond to. So I guess what I'm trying to say is understanding the professor's needs, understanding your own interests, and then finding kind of additional ways to make yourself um, valuable in that process really helps uh, distinguish yourself and also helps you think about what part of this whole process do I like, right? Do I like what the professors asked me? And then you can also say, okay, maybe I like something else too, which is thinking about how to convey those concepts in a, in a, to students. And then that made me interested in, uh, in, in, in thinking about how I would develop research ideas and convey them to other people. So I think my point being, I think, going that extra step in directions that appeal to you makes you a very good RA. Don't do RA in a subject that you don't like. Yeah. Yeah. Don't do it. It's going to be painful for everybody. I don't know if they went around. I don't have much time. I've never been an RA um, at Princeton, but I guess I can give a very quick, like, where to find the opportunities. Um, one, like, Princeton student employment webpage has RA ships posted just like any other student job that you can apply to. Um, and like Vera was saying, if you look at them, all the prereqs are always like basic knowledge of Stata, basic knowledge of R. So having that command um, is definitely like a necessary condition. Um, I'll also say like in my personal experience in Princeton, I've never done this personally, but I have lots of friends who have just, you know, cold emailed professors and said, hey, I'm interested in this. I know it's probably what you're a researcher interested in. Are you willing to take RAs? Or are you willing to connect me with someone who is taking RAs right now? And at least at Princeton, like professors always respond to those emails positively. And I've never heard of someone not getting a good response in some way. So I would say if you're looking for opportunities, talking to your professor and just maybe like sending an email is like the first step. Oh, can I add something that people, I don't know, I don't know how much thought you guys have put on this, but if you're an RA, one thing I think is very valuable is if you're organized about your RA as well. So one thing that I faced a lot is like whenever I hire an RA, I have to sp spend lots of time like, of training their RA or just organizing their work so it can be useful for me to afterwards. But I, if I could just give one practical tip is whenever you're programming something, like keep, a, keep it very organized. It's going to be for you, good for you, and also for the person who you're working with. It's good for you because probably you're going to be able to reuse this in your own research if you've done it well. It's good for the, for the person who is, good, who is hiring you, but just first because you're going to give a very good impression. And second, because this person is also going to be able to re reutilize the, everything that you did. So think about this as a practical thing, like be organized about your RAs work. For sure, those are some great tips. Thanks so much for sharing. There are definitely a lot of opportunities. Um, so I should touch a little bit more on some things that I and Julia mentioned earlier about kind of um, going a step beyond what you're told to do and, and really use it as an opportunity to learn. Um, I think the professors here always have research on very interesting topics that are not necessarily taught through a course and kind of by doing this RA work, you're essentially almost taking on additional class, but then also um, even getting closer to the material and learning something new and exciting, which is something I personally really appreciate. Um, and I know Lyra kind of went in this direction a little bit, um, 
you, you were kind of talking about how your research experience has led you to, uh, to decide to become an academic. So just kind of wanted to um, hear your thoughts and Faisal's thoughts as well on how um, you know your undergrad and graduate experiences kind of shaped um, how, how you think about your future. And, and then um, perhaps if you could also talk about what's exciting in your field of research today. <laughs> okay, yeah. So I actually, I mean, I don't, it's not going to be that clean for everyone, so I apologize if this sounds a bit much, much of an outlier, but for me, kind of, I can draw a pretty direct link between a class that I took in undergrad and then the idea to do research and then kind of what led me to, to be here almost. So, but I mean, that, that, that shows you the power of a good professor and the power of a good class and being interested in, or, and taking classes not because they look good on your CV, but taking classes that actually you're interested in. So um, sophomore year, I took an uh, undergraduate development economics course um, with Dean Carlin, who's a big name in economic development. And at that point, I just took it. I had no clue. I said, oh, this is interesting. And then that was the first time I saw principles from you know, the core micro and macro being applied in a way that improved people's lives or damaged people's lives, but actually had real impact in developing country contexts. And starting from that, I, one of his specialties was looking at financial markets in developing countries. Sophomore year, between that summer, I, I, I shadowed um, at a microfinance bank in Pakistan, which is where I'm from. That was what my senior thesis was about at undergrad. Fast forward to me now writing my job market paper about microfinance, not microfinance, but financial markets in developing countries and how digitization of these markets affects discrimination. So point being, there's a, it, it sounds almost poetic, but it's not. It's just kind of, that's where, that's taking that class and then being an RA. Being an RA, I think, helped me develop some of the methods. Taking that class made me interested in the topic, and then kind of bringing that, all that forward made me, made me want to do that in, a, in my professional life. So, yeah. For me, it was definitely not straightforward. <laughs> so, so, I think, like, the, the way that I thought that I think about my experience as, as uh, in research during my undergrad. So I, let me tell you just the project that I did. So I was, there was this professor that was, was, I studied in the University of Brasilia, which is the capital of Brazil, and a lot of the professors there were involved with the government, through the government somehow. So I started just doing like data work. Literally I had to collect data and then we were like feeding some very simple model to this data. And, but one thing that I realized doing this is that I like to research. No, but it's not true that everybody likes it because it can be very lonely, it's very time consuming. Most of the time you're frustrated because things are not working the way that you expect. And the reason that you like it because it's like there is this point that everything works and you find it beautiful and then this kind of compensates for all the work that you've done. Okay, if you are this person, uh, you, you might still be deciding, right, whether you are not, you are or not. But then if you are, it's like the natural step should take the, uh, uh, be a graduate student, right? Because it's going to be where you're actually going to develop the ability, like the tools that you need to be a, a very successful researcher. So what happened to me is that I came, okay, I did the undergrad. I thought, okay, I like research. So let me do at least a master. So let's go to the master degree. And there you have to do like a more a more like complete project, I would say, like in my fa my my master thesis. And then doing my master thesis, I thought, okay, that was not enough either because I didn't have enough time to to research uh, to do to to finish this research. I think there is more to be learned. And then I learned that okay, if I want to work as a researcher, at the time I didn't think that I was going to be an academic. I was thinking that I, go, I was going to the private sector, but I realized that the good researchers in the private sector had a PhD. So I said, okay, now let's do a PhD. And then in the PhD, you take even more time and then you learn how to do research and it's a, it's a, long, it's a long process. And, and, and there, as I told you already, this story was when I came together with the frontier of research that that I realized that I wanted to be an academic, that I think is the closest that you can be to research, because I can take the time now to study for a whole year one subject. I don't, I'm not pressured with time and etc. But of course, there is also other types of research that you can do 
for example, in the financial industry, if you work, if you work for a hedge fund, there's tons of research that needs to be done in order to make uh, this portfolio locational for, for, for example, for policy, if you work for the Fed or etc. So, so in a sense, for me, it was a step by step and needing to know more on what it is there to be done. So like the, the interesting for the questions and realize that I needed more tools to answer those questions. And then I needed to be more time studying to be able to work with those questions. And so, so that's a little bit of my story. So in a sense, like uh, you can go step by step and, and you, you get a project and you might like it, you might not like it and it's okay. And in this, then you ask also like what is exciting, right? In my area of research. Uh, I, I think, well, <laughs> I, I've been working a lot recently with corporate bonds. And what I think is exciting there is first, if you think about the US economy, the market for corporate bonds, it more than doubled since the great financial crisis. So, so what does that mean is that corporations are issuing debt, but in a particular way that is traded directly in the secondary market, right? So instead of going to a, to a bank and getting a loan, they're issuing bonds that are traded like stocks. But different than stocks, this market is very opaque. Why is it opaque? Because it's not traded in exchanges, right? So it's not that I am able to see the prices of a corporate bond there all the time. If you are trading corporate bonds, what you need is to call your broker. So you're a big institution, you call your broker, say, I have $1 billion of Apple bonds. What do I do? I need to sell them. How do I do? And then this broker will call the other broker and probably will divide this order in many small orders to try to place this bond. So that means that there is a lot of institutional details about the market for corporate bonds that is not present in the market of equity, in stocks that we know. And, and it's because there is so little data about the market for corporate bonds that we know very little about it. But what happened is that recently you have more and more and more data about it. So beginning with prices, but also what are the institutions who hold those bonds? And also, and then recently we had the Fed, for example, buying corporate bonds. And so, uh, and also another, so it's a market that is growing a lot. So it's not only that companies are issuing more, but it's becoming a more important uh, share of the portfolio of institutional investors is corporate bonds. So uh, part of my research is trying to understand that. So basically how, how, understanding more of this market, but in particular, for example, how does the behavior of institutional investors or maybe of monetary policy is affecting the prices, okay, of those corporate bonds, and then by itself, how it's changing the incentives of companies of now not, e not taking a loan from a bank, but actually issuing a bond directly in the secondary market. Thank you so much. It's also really interesting how you both had kind of different pathways to research and, and you um, shared with us, you know, how there are a lot of different possibilities and, and honestly, I think for us, there are a lot of different options that we can explore as well and perhaps, um, you know, some people will work in industry for a few years and then come back to academia and um, yeah, just thank you so much for sharing. And I guess for Leland and Emily, since you're seniors and you have very exciting plans ahead. I would also love to hear how you think your undergrad experience at Princeton and, and maybe with research specifically uh, will be helpful in your future careers. Yeah, I can start. Um, I think the junior paper gave me a lot of direction uh, in the sense that it was my first time like working with this large data set. Uh, I had to go through this project of understanding the data, understanding what's wrong with it, and understanding that some parts of that um, I can fix and some parts of that I can't fix. Uh, and that whole exper uh, like experiment like made me realize I really loved econometrics and I really loved like working with messy data. Um, so it kind of like one like made me realize I wasn't sure if I wanted to do like a whole academic like get a PhD because you know I'm still not there yet but it made me want to like kind of experience that more. So I guess like when I looked for opportunities after I graduate, I knew I wanted to do something still 
like econometrics heavy and still working in the data. So I'm doing that next year, doing like econ consulting. Um, but it was a lot of great direction for me because I knew I didn't want to like lose that data work after uh, I love my JP so much. Um, yeah, so I could start by saying um, I'll be going into finance next year or after I graduate. So I'll be working um, as a trader. And similar to Leland, I think what what I'm going to apply most, I think, from my experiences and research as an undergrad is knowledge of how to work with data. Um, for instance, this past summer, one of the projects I did for a desk during my internship was trying to forecast the supply and demand of natural gas in the US. Um, and I directly used things I learned from my undergrad courses about how to you know, uh, find data, clean data, and then use that data to make a, you know, well, you could start by making just a simple regression for that prediction, but it could also take more advanced, uh, do, do a more advanced analysis. So, uh, but, but at the fundamental level, knowing how to work with data and um, you know, I think also courses at Princeton that have taught me to leverage tools like Python and knowing how to code have been immensely helpful for me as well, not only in, um, in outside of academia, but also in academia, because I've used Python very much for cleaning my data um, this year and especially last year where I worked with textual data, which was very unstructured. Um, so, so yeah, to summarize, I think knowing how to work with data and use that data to conduct some sort of analysis will be helpful for me um, in my future career as a trader and probably in um, most industries you go into, knowing how to work with data is essential. Yeah, that's great to hear. So now we'll open it up to the audience to ask any questions to our panelists. Shirley, um, thank you so much for such a wonderful conversation. Um, I'm currently a sophomore. I think you have going to the econ department, and I'm also working in RA position as well. But something I find very difficult is being able to take very rigorous advanced classes while also scheduling time, dedicating time to be a good RA and to go that extra step. So I'm wondering how you guys thought about balancing these like you know, competing priorities when you were an undergrad or even in your PhD. I have a couple of thoughts on this. So I think, that, because I, I completely understand. I remember also, you know, you're in undergrad, you're not just doing, you're not just a student, you have extracurriculars, you have a lot of other competing uh, interests on your time. So I think for me, the best, there are two things that I would say. The first thing is um, under promise and over deliver. So by that I mean, don't over promise and under deliver. I think there's a temptation when you're with a professor who's done really big things in the field and you're kind of in awe of them to say, oh, this all sounds so exciting. I want to learn, I want to, I, I want to work more on this. And so you say, oh, I can get all of this done by next week or I can get all of this done by a certain amount of time. And then of course, fast forward, you have a problem set, you, you have maybe an extracurricular engagement, whatever it might be, and then it becomes much harder. So I think being very clear about your, uh, your, your own availability internally is really important. And then the second thing I would say is then don't be afraid to externalize that, right? To say, to kind of push back appropriately and say, oh, okay, this is, I, I, I have these things going on. And so I can probably come back to you with this version. So obviously there's a combative way of saying that and saying, I can't do it at all. But then there's another way of saying that, which is saying, okay, this all sounds great. I'm really interested. Just FYI, I have these things coming up this week. So I, I might only be able to get this far. I think communicating that in advance is really, really helpful on both sides because the professors don't know what else you've got going on in your life. And I think making sure that you communicate that, most nine times out of 10, they'll be okay with it. Thank you. May I add to this? So many times in research, either you don't know exactly what is the result that you're looking for, or like what, and the problem is that you usually don't know how much time it takes to do certain things. So as an RA, it's very, very common that we think that it's something that is easy to be done and it turns out to be much harder than you thought. As a professor, you've been there and you know this, but as I'm only going to be able to know that you've worked and you just didn't deliver because it's worse hard if you tell me, right? 
So I think it's very important, I would say, that like the, 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 the point is that the process belongs to the research as well. It's not like we are expecting that you just deliver the final good. So I think one way to say is like you have a dedicated time that you're doing RA for, that it's reasonable to your schedule, and then whatever you do in this time, do it well. But it's okay if you didn't find to the end process as long as you communicate this. So I did this, this, and this. The results are here. I didn't get to the final because I still need to do this and this and this. And this is a good, like, weekly report. <coughs> Just yeah. something I definitely struggle with is the fear of, like, letting down a professor you respect. But that's super helpful advice. Just communicate that things aren't working out. Yes. Communicate what I've done. <laughs> I did this. And the problem that I didn't do this is because I, I encountered this. It's completely okay. I just want to quickly add, if you're finding it hard to manage or balance that during the school year, there are also many, many opportunities for summer RA ships, so that's something you can look into. Um, when you, if, if you have more time over the summer, you could also uh, take on an RA ship. Um, so Princeton is a pretty competitive place, I'd say. And so when you talk about what you're looking for in an RA, and I guess this is targeted towards more the PhD postdocs who are past that stage and are looking for students, what do you look for past kind of like basic staff skills or like programming? Like what differentiates an applicant? I, for me, at least, it's interested in the field. Uh, I think it's very important that I feel that the, the person that I'm working with in terms of undergrad is that you're actually interested because in a sense, like I could hire someone online, which is the hourly pay is going to be cheaper. Probably I won't have to train the person and, and the work is going to be done in more like automatic manner. So if you're, if you're a professor and you take the time to work with a student, you, you also, I think every, you are thinking about the development of that student as well. So I think in order for you to get it, so that means that this professor or a researcher is going to dedicate time on you, student. So you want to know that this is this is valuable, right? So I think for me it would be like, I would, I would like that this person is interested in the project or in the area or in learning more. Yeah, I think the other thing that really differentiates for me, I, I've had RAs for my other research projects, is having a having a positive and good attitude is really important. Even just even in the interview process, um, I think I think in a way, what someone who's who's doing research for full time, they're kind of bogged down in their work. It's very refreshing to work with someone who's maybe doing it for the summer an undergrad. You kind of almost have this expectation that this person is going to bring new energy, positivity to the project. And so I think that's also something that's really important, which only comes from if you, if it's genuine, I think it's only genuine if you genuinely care about the project, like Vera said. So I think, I think those two kind of go together, but I think having a positive attitude goes a long way. Um, hi, thank you so much for having such an insightful conference. Um, I just wanted to ask all of you, is there somebody that you looked up to when you were in, the, were you in when you were an undergraduate looking towards, you know, potentially doing this whole research thing? Is there somebody that, you know, did you have any idols or heroes going through it? Idols, I mean, I, I, I think I, my my advisors are my idols, but I, I think that they became, they were not <laughs> like beforehand. And I think I was lucky enough, maybe. So, so I think I would rephrase it a little bit. So usually the way that I think about academic work is that there are people whose work you really admire. And I think you guys are very lucky to be in an institution like Princeton, who right across the door from your from the place that you're sitting there those academic those extremely amazing researchers so it's very easy to find this person who you admire and then from admiring this person uh, i think like becoming uh, like this idol this person that you're going to be able to follow i think it's a, it's a 
it's going to be a matching scheme. It's whether whether it works or it doesn't. It might work, it might not work. And the good thing is that you still have a little bit of time, right? So you might try like working with one advisor and then like going for a talk and just ask about your opinion and then you maybe you feel a click and this is the person that you work wanna work with. If it doesn't, so you go to the next. So so I think it's a relationship <laughs> more than the uh, advising someone and working with someone. Of course, there is a hierarchy there, and you should respect your professors. But but it is it is a relationship that it has to work for both sides. That's it. Kind of a specific. My idol was my undergrad advisor, who then I ended up RAing for, and so her name is uh, Sega Benedict Stolter. She's from Iceland. Anyway, um, what I loved about working with her was I think the reason she became my idol was that she obviously was very competent and worked on a lot of policy relevant things, and 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 so was making an impact and a change in the world, which is obviously inspiring. But then I think what what made her my idol was that she also had a very pleasant personality and, and would ask and engage about, oh, what's going on with you? Even though, you know, at that point, it seemed like my life is not interesting compared to hers. And so point <laughs> being, that may not appeal to everyone. Maybe that's not what you want in an idol. But I think it, in my experience, that that was something that really meant a lot to me. Um, it's interesting to hear that because, you know, I think what could really help me in terms of going towards this whole research thing would be kind of emulating people that have already done it, seeing what they, what qualities they possess, like what you're talking about in terms of positive attitude, you mentioned it's both something that your idol had and also what you would want in an ideal RA. Mm -hmm. um, so I think really kind of looking for, I'm lucky to be here to have all these interesting people to talk to about it. Um, so yeah, thanks for sharing. That, that's, that's, uh, it's funny, I never thought about this. I never thought, like, who would be my out of my, my academic research. But it, so one thing that is that we're saying, I think that so when you come as a young researcher, I think it's very difficult, at least for me, I, I look at, like, open any curriculum of a Princeton professor. They will be incredibly productive, right? And they will be probably changing their field. It's very hard to understand how they became that person. And and I don't think there is a recipe either that like do this and you become Atif. Yeah. It's it's not it's, it's not it's, I don't think it's going to be that that straightforward. But one thing that I think is very, very interesting, uh, with the ability of working with, with these people is that they will share with us what they've done. So, and naturally, you're going to kind of follow the steps. And what I mean by this is usually, like, the way that you get your research idea or the way that you get your research project is going to depend person to person for, like, different people do it differently. But I, I see myself how I, I approach a, a research project nowadays, and I see myself approaching exactly as my advisors did. So, in that sense, I, I, I learned much more than the, exactly the topic that I was working on. Like I learned much more than just us pricing, working with these professors. I learned more about like the methodology of doing research, even not the methodology of that paper. So in that sense, it's again, it's this matching mechanism that it has to be a, the per, it has to be a person that inspires you, that's very, very, very important, that you learn from, and then you, that you enjoy. In the end of the day, you have to enjoy. You're going to spend so much time in doing it that you have to enjoy. Thanks. Yeah, I think what's interesting about the conversation we just had is that human side of research, because we always think about it as really rigorous work, but kind of a central theme around, I think, all of the questions and, and your answers is to, you know, be really transparent in, in the communications, having that passion, but really seeing who you're working with as a person and, and you know, be an interesting person as well. So I think that's something that's really interesting that came out of it. I don't know if there was a question on this side. That oh, yeah. I just wanted to thank you all for coming and sharing your experiences with us. I think it's very insightful. 
Uh, so I guess my question is, um, I guess um, in regards to the qualifications necessary for an undergrad RA, uh, like next to the passion and interest, obviously, do you think an RA should have necessary skills such as knowledge in, knowledge in Stata or Python or modeling prior to approaching a professor? Uh, I'm really new to all of this and I'm really interested in it, but I just wanted to ask you. experience being an RA, um, but I didn't I didn't know how to use data until my junior year, um, and I learned how to use Python through some of the computer science courses I took, but that didn't happen until the end of my sophomore year. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say don't worry if you don't have those those skills or those, those tools yet. Um, I'm not sure in terms of RA trips, but I definitely think you develop those skills as you um, advance in your undergraduate career, and I think most of those skills I learned my, my junior and senior year. I would add that um, I remember also feeling kind of intimidated when people brought up coding or like technical skills. Like I never took computer science in high school. I never really took a lot of it here. But I remember like my freshman sophomore year, I would get very intimidated when people brought up, oh, you need coding skills for this. Um, and maybe this isn't particularly deep advice, but I think, uh, like, you can learn it. Like, you, it's not, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, like, either, like, open resources, like, there's tons of them out there. Or you just take, like, kind of what Emily said, your natural progression of classes, econometrics, um, like, maybe close to 126, maybe go 313. And, like, you learn it. It's not, like, a huge barrier to entry. I don't know if you guys want to talk about it, but I don't think you necessarily need super sophisticated uh, tools to be like a good RA. I think um, for my, so I work with an RA who didn't know much of Stata, and I think um, some working familiarity, but not a lot. The one thing I would add is that Princeton, I believe there are coding or programming workshops uh, that Oscar Torres. Yeah, it's at the uh, Data Services uh, Library, and then Pixie, uh, Princeton Institute for computational science. Yes. Really, so even if you don't want to take a computer science course, you can still learn how to code. And for econ majors, Oscar's now based wholly uh, within the econ department, so we have a tremendous research resource. So, so, so yeah, the one thing I would say is there are resources that are freely available to you if you learn better. I learn better, certainly, when someone, a human, is teaching it rather than learning it on YouTube. That's just me. But So there are incredible resources that are available, even if you're, say, interested in geospatial stuff, which I was interested in, there's a whole GIS library, uh, the GIS team that does a lot of that stuff. So the resources are available, and even if someone has working familiarity, I think, again, if you have a willingness to learn, at least in my the experience with my RA, um, you're normally the professor or the grad student or the postdoc will have a, 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 a vault of code or things that they've done in the past, and then, again, if you're, so you, very rarely will you be starting something from scratch. And even if you are, there'll be a reference point that they'll give you saying, oh, use this code that I wrote for this other project that I worked on. And so I think having that familiarity and then becoming more familiar with it and willing to be invest, invest the time, you, 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 you should be able to get there. And I'll tell you more. I think for, for the things that we do as an economist, uh, a lot of it you are going to learn by doing. So uh, I think like I would recommend any one of you here if you want to do research, I think you should take a workshop. It's just like it's the easiest way to start because if you're going to do it by yourself, you're going to have to learn like tons of things that you're going to take tons of time. So use, use the resources, but this is not going to be enough for you to become a good programmer. So either you want to continue to do research or you want to be a trader or to be a consultant. Like, you're going to need the skills going forward. And the best way to get the skills is working with it. And then I guess, like, the opportunity as an RA, as we are talking about, is a good one because then you're, it's a way for you to, to, to get familiar with, with this programming language. And I'll tell you from my experience, so when I arrived to Colombia, uh, I program only in R. I didn't program in Python. And I was invited to work with Tano Santos and Ken Daniel. Those are two professors at Columbia uh, Business School. And the thing was that Ken, he was a previous uh, CFO at Goldman, and everything that he did was in Python. 
and then he told me like would you be willing to do this research and i prefer that it would be that it is in python i didn't know anything about python and what happened was that i think as lilan is saying you are smart if you need to learn you are going to learn and in my case i need it right so okay it was painful the first two weeks uh, like everything took like twice the time that i that it took in Pi took in python rather if i did it now it did but in the end i learned and and i think like and then if you like it naturally you're going to be become a better programmer because you're going to do it more and more and more if you don't then you don't you know that you don't like it i want to say quickly i think it's it's more important, at least in my opinion, to have just a solid knowledge of econometrics because there's really no point in trying to translate that econometrics into SATA or Python code if you don't understand the econometrics and you don't understand what you're really doing. So I just want to say that as well. I think the coding and SATA part is, is more is on the easier side than gaining the fundamental econometric solids that you need to conduct research. I'll say one last thing, which is sometimes the first program is the hardest one, and then it's not as hard to kind of the marginal cost of getting the additional program, even if they might seem very different. I think just familiarity with one program and just how to visualize data, how to clean it, just those soft skills really translate over. I didn't know any R or machine learning really before my, my job market paper, and then because I knew Stata quite well, just translating that over was not, I mean, it was like everything took twice as long, very frustrating initially, but then it was easier to learn an additional language if you already have one that you know well. Thank you very much. I want to speak to the hero question for a second, because Leland pointed out that many of the professors post for RA positions, but what I would say is if you're taking a course with a professor you feel particularly engaged with, you know, Go to their office hours, connect with them, even if it's a lecture course. Make sure you're asking questions and you're engaged because I'll be honest, they generally tend to tap students for the RA positions that they need. That's just the reality because that's the way that they can leave things out. Who's been raising their hand? Who's been engaged? Who seems to be talking to them the most? They're, when they have a research opportunity come up, they're going to ask them if they're interested in it. So what I would say is in terms of that I hear, if there's a professor you're feeling particularly engaged by or with, reach out to them. They are available. They will really make themselves available. And those are the ways that you can pursue finding a research opportunity, probably the best. Or even asking them, like you said, you know, sending an email. Thank you. That's good advice. And I'll tell you, like, honestly, even for me as a grad student already, I remember, like, at Columbia, for the two first years, you have to take courses and then you're supposed to start your research. It's not an easy transition going to take, cor take coursework and do your own research. What I did that I thought it was extremely useful was in the summer of my second year, this is grad student, so I, the timing might be a little different. But in that summer that I knew that I had to transition to research, I chose a professor that I liked the research, and I knocked his door and said, look, I have the summer, I will, I, I'm looking to work as an RA, and I like your research agenda, do you have a project? And then he told me that he didn't. He said, like, no, I don't have anything to work on now, and, but I'll, I'll keep you in mind. And then what happened that one week later, he, he sent me an email saying, you know what, Lita, I need to do this. Would you be, are you interested? And the thing is, like, the fact that I knocked his door a week before, I think put, put in his mind that I was looking for someone for this opportunity. And then when he came, in this case, came very fast, I worked with him during the summer. It was an RA at the time, like, so I put more hours because it was summer. And then what happened is that later, so I finished, finished uh, summer, and then I, it was interesting because I read some things, I, and I, I came up with a research idea. This professor, his name is Olivier Darmoni. He, he, is a, an assist, he was an assistant professor at the time, and he became part of my committee. And then some months later, he had a research idea, and he came to me and asked, would you be willing to work with me on this research idea? And I think this only happened because we had this experience before. So I came from knocking the door, asking, working with him, and I think having a good experience working with him, to becoming a co-author in a completely new project. 
Yeah, I guess whenever I talk to, you know, people that are older than me, adults, uh, older students, like, you always at first think about oh, where they are, like what they're currently doing. But if you really talk to all of them, whether it's like your parents or, you know, the people in front of us, um, like there's always that kind of like serendipitous moment that like everything changes. Um, and it's kind of hard to like be in a position where you're, where you want to do something, you want to help the world or whatever. Um, and you just, well, by the nature of it, you'll never know when they come up. So I guess, the message I'm taking away from what you guys are saying is really to just go for it, keep trying, cast a wide net. Um, so I'm definitely going to look to do that. And don't be discouraged if the first time doesn't work out. <laughs> Can I ask a very specific question about the, uh, the ORF department here? What do you guys think of the uh, ORF department and what classes do you think might be helpful for economics research in that department? Well, I've, so I've taken ORF 309 and I've taken ORF 363. Um, I think ORF 309, you also took ORF I think that was helpful. Um, just having a, because statistics and probability are very related fields, so um, I think that was very helpful. Um, not, not, not so much because you're, you know, actually applying econometrics or probability to like, to real world problems, but more so just to um, teach you teach you about uh, probability distributions and things that you need for econometrics and statistics, um, which you need for research. But I think I, I'm not sure um, if you've taken any other courses in the ORF department that might be directly transferable to research fields. But you can also think of some in the economics department. Um, you know, specifically econometrics and econometric applications were very two very helpful courses. Um, so th those are the ones I'd say. Yeah, the only, I guess, the one thing I would add about the ORF department specifically, um, and I would reiterate what Emily said about ORF 309, it's a great class to talk about probability and comes up in econometrics a lot. Um, I guess if you're interested in machine learning, that's kind of more, there's not really any machine learning class in the econ department. So like ORF 350 is, an, is a, like an NL class, there's also COS 324, so if you're interested in that, optimization, ORF 363 also does a little bit of machine learning. Um, I would also say that any of Professor Kornhauser's classes are really effective because those classes, um, either the final project or along the way, there's this huge, really large, intricate data exercise, um, which would probably give you like really great experience working with big data I remember, like, I never took it, but I have a lot of friends that did. They have, like, pulled huge amounts of observations. So it's, like, a very big technical dive of challenge. So I would recommend any of Professor Kornhauser's classes, too, if you're interested in, like, learning more about data and how it can be applied to research. I also just want to say, I think any really applied course that's sort of related is, is very helpful. For instance, uh, you mentioned OR350. I think that, or is, which one is, I forgot which one's the machine learning. Course. Yeah, but that's more of a theoretical approach. Whereas, so I took Coast 424, which was Fundamentals of Machine Learning, and that's where, so in that course we had three main projects and we actually applied the machine learning we, we learned to um, solve those three research problems. And I think having courses in, where, in which they you're applying all the knowledge you're learning and not just learning the theory of it, I found to be super helpful in research. My, uh, my, my co-author for this project, a good friend of mine, she was the TA, she was the preceptor for 313, is that 313 econometric application? Yes. Yeah. So, um, and I know from her grading experience was that she, the kind of assignments are exactly take this data set or replicate this piece of econometric analysis that someone did for this paper. And, and, the, and in a way, it's a great entry point because all the data cleaning, everything else has been done by the professor or the preceptor because they want to change it up every week and give you a new problem. And it so sort of really means a lot of the grunt work is taken care of and then you really get to do the analysis. And I think that's a really unique thing that can only be learned while you're in that type of class environment. Yeah, 313 is a great class for um, getting good at data analysis in real time. Yeah. I also asked about the financial mathematics part of ORF. Like, did you guys think or consider taking any like asset pricing classes? or bond pricing classes, and I wonder if those are helpful at all, in your opinion. 
But I, I personally haven't. I think it, it depends on what you're interested in for research. I think if you are interested in, um, in that field and want to conduct research in that field, I'd imagine it could give you a good background into, um, into that. But I, I, I don't have any experience taking those courses. I took ORF 335, which is the financial mathematics course. Um, it's like a theory course, so I don't know like how helpful it is for like research projects, but I think it is like the backbone for a lot of ORF senior theses that are interested in uh, asset prices or like asset trends, I guess. Um, but it's more of like a theory course. Thank you so much. Um, I guess this is directed more towards the two undergraduates, but maybe you guys, if you guys wouldn't mind, could you share like a bit of a timeline as to like how you guys got into everything? Like, did the research really start with your junior papers? And then like, were you guys doing research in the summer or was the summers more like the consulting and trading kind of thing? Just sort of what to expect. I can start. Um, so junior year, I didn't come up with my topic until around September. I think that's also when we chose advisors. Is that correct? In September, maybe even October. Um, so I didn't really think about research at all until I started my junior year, and that's when I came up with my topic. Um, so conducted research throughout my junior year, but honestly, was I would struggle a lot in the beginning because I had a really hard time knowing how to approach the research and. Um, being so new to it, even just like how to structure my paper, um, or and, and like I mentioned before, the thing I had the most trouble with was methodology. So it wasn't until I took Eco 313, which I, we've mentioned this course so many times, but we took it um, our junior spring, and that's really when I started to work on my paper because that course taught me so much about um, the different approaches to answering research questions. And I realized that a lot of the things I thought of before were probably not the right way of going about it or a good way of going about my research questions. So um, did the bulk of my work, I'd say February, March, and then submitted April. Um, over the summer, so the summer after my junior year, I didn't do any research. I did an internship in trading. Um, however, I was, so it was a rotational program and one of the rotations I spent time on was the the mortgage um, the mortgage rotation. So it was all mortgage products and you know all mortgage securities, securitized products like mortgage backed securities, um, commercial, you know anything like that. So spending time on that desk was what sparked my interest in then pursuing a research project on mortgages and mortgage delinquencies. But I wasn't, and I think that internship gave me a lot of the background knowledge, like how a mortgage pays off and what I needed to know to start off my research. But, but no, I didn't, I didn't conduct research specifically this past summer. I think it just inspired my research topic this year and gave me some of the background knowledge I needed. Um, yeah, so like, I guess my like first stab at research was like sophomore summer when me and my friend just like tried to write an economics paper. I like, Obviously, like we didn't have enough structure, like understood what to do. So I think it would have been a lot more helpful to have like had an experience of being an RA, kind of seeing what the research process looks. Um, and, you know, kind of I did my junior paper. I would also like reiterate what Emily said. Um, I worked like every summer in like a like an internship. I never like did a research and research assistant like summer. But I would reiterate that like those experiences kind of helped formulate what I was interested in. So for example, my freshman summer, I worked at the SEC, um, and that was kind of my first experience with securities fraud, kind of securities litigation. Uh, so when I was kind of looking at um, potential topics for my junior paper, I knew that I was largely interested in kind of the intersection of securities, economics, and law. Um, and I kind of knew that I wanted to do something kind of related to what I saw the lawyers doing at the SEC, and I kind of found this really awesome literature on securities fraud litigation. So um, I didn't have any like RA summer experiences, but I definitely like tapped what I thought was interesting about my summers into my research. I think we're coming up on time here, so uh, we'll wrap it up there. But you know, I, I you all shared really really interesting insights and, and tips. But I thought maybe at the end, if we could just go around again, and then for each of you to share one thing that you hope our audience can take away from this conversation um, really quickly. You could just do a rapid fire, starting with the 
Yeah, I would say, especially if you're a freshman, sophomore, and like you're afraid that you don't have the technical skills, I would say like don't put that much pressure or stress on yourself because um, they'll come and you can kind of learn them as you go uh, and don't like stress out too much about it. You'll, you'll learn them. Yeah, I think it, it definitely becomes easier as you go along and as you get experience. The junior paper was really hard for me, but I think it gave me such good practice for my senior thesis. And um, even though it was a struggle my junior year, now I really know how to approach my thesis in a yeah, much better because I've had that experience. So yeah, I think it gets better as you go. <laughs> Well, I guess, well, learning from what Emily is saying and also like what I feel like the a little bit of like the question is like how you get started. Uh, I think one takeaway that I, I should take have in mind is again research they research idea they 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 don't just appear on you. It's an active process, mm -hmm. and this active process you don't need to do alone and you can literally use the huge advantages that you guys have, which is to be a Princeton and use like the people that you have around to help you to, to shape this research idea so it becomes a real project. Yeah, I, I, was, I was just reiterating the last point, that's what I was gonna say. Use the resources that are available to you. You have an incredible wealth of resources that I, if I were in your shoes, I, I wish someone had told me because in just in terms of the, the, the workshops that we talked about, the, the office hours uh, the, the, the professors have, don't be intimidated, please use all the resources. Especially as undergrads, you have this incredible wealth of resources that are just at your fingertips. So please use them. Sure, yeah, those are some great advice. Thank you so much again for joining us. Uh, for the uh, no, about resources, I need to yeah. say this, like I was not familiar with the Princeton clusters and the IT is involved with the clusters. And they're just amazing. So coming from different institutions, you guys have no idea yeah. how amazing they are. They're extremely good. And in the sense like this is a resource. So if you're working with big data, for example, or if you need a lot of computing power, you have everything in your fingerprints, like Fazan is saying. And not only this, you have people who help you to start. So it's very, like they respond to you like in a matter of hours. And actually, I, I had someone walk me through the process of putting my data in the cluster and getting started. So I guess this is a resource that you guys have available, and you should really, really use it. Thank you so much again. If we could just give a big round of applause.